Okay, so in this video, we are going to get to the third part of our journey through time period four. So remember, time period four takes us from 1450 up through 1750, the start of European exploration to the start of the Industrial Revolution. And remember, we've done this in three parts. The first part was looking at how Europe transformed. We did that. The next part were the places directly impacted by Europe. So we looked at the Americas and we looked at Africa. And now we're done with that part. So now we're on to the third part and these are the places that were indirectly affected by Europe. And so here we're going to start looking at China and Japan. And then finally, we're going to look at the Dar al Islam. So we are here now. We're going to start looking at China and Japan. And this is our first look at what's been going on in China and Japan during this time period. So for those of you keeping track, this is chapter 26. And we're going to pick up our story where exactly where we left off with our story, with the Mongols are in charge of China. And if you remember, this dynasty was called the Uwan dynasty. And it was founded by Gen one of Genghis Khan's grandsons. He took the name Kublai Khan. Uh, we also noted before that the Yuan Dynasty does not last very long. It lasts for less than a century. And we know that dynasties or other governments that last less than a century usually are pretty unstable. And the Yuan Dynasty really wasn't any different. So we know that it was founded by Kublai Khan. We also know that they were pretty discriminatory towards the Chinese. So they looked down on Confucianism. They didn't allow people, or they didn't allow the Chinese to learn the Mongolian language. or marry a Mongolian. And they even went so far as to bring in foreign bureaucrats because the Mongols didn't trust the Chinese. So these foreign bureaucrats might have come from Persia, from the Ilkhanate, or they might have come from Central Asia, and the Chagatai Khanate. But they really didn't trust Chinese bureaucrats, mostly because Chinese bureaucrats were Confucian and the Mongols didn't trust the Confucians and they didn't trust the Chinese bureaucrats who were also Confucian. Now, the Yuan Dynasty collapsed for a couple of reasons. 
some of it was their fault, some of it was not their fault, but it still ends up with their collapse. So things that weren't their fault was the outbreak of bubonic plague. So this is the same plague that hit Europe. So it's the same one. This is just where it started. Uh, just like in Europe, about 25 to 30 million people died in China. And that would destabilize even the strongest of governments. So this led to instability. At the same time, the Chinese are upset about Mongol restrictive policies that we outlined above. So all of this stuff, especially the stuff against Confucianism. And on top of that, the economy collapsed because the Mongols reintroduced paper money without having enough gold to back it up. Basically, they just started printing money. And if you don't have any actual gold to back up the printed money, to say that this piece of paper is worth this much gold, if you don't have the gold, then it's just a piece of paper. And so they just printed money, which caused the value of the money to plummet. It wasn't worth anything. So the economy collapsed. All of this led to rebellions in the 1360s, and finally, The Chinese defeated the Mongols in 1368, and we get the next Chinese dynasty called the Ming Dynasty. Now, the Ming Dynasty is a reassertion of all the Chinese stuff we've talked about so far. It reasserts everything Chinese. So, for instance, they create a really centralized government, which was different from the Mongols, 
who basically just let everyone do their own thing. Unless it angered the Mongols. So the Mongols were pretty decentralized, but there were certain things that the Mongols really cared a lot about, like Confucianism or paying your taxes. You had to pay your taxes. They didn't like Confucianism, but everything else, they basically just let you do your own thing. The Ming create a really centralized government. And there are two components of this centralized government that we need to pay attention to. We've got the mandarins and the eunuchs. They are both really important for understanding how the Ming are going to run things. So the mandarins are bureaucrats who passed the Confucian civil service exam. So the Confucian education system is back, the Confucian exam is back, and now these people who have passed the exam have a name. They're called mandarins. And so the mandarins enforce Ming policies throughout China. And there's a very strict hierarchy of mandarins. There are nine ranks. And basically anybody who works for the government falls into one of these nine ranks. So these guys are all throughout China. The other group are the eunuchs. Now, to define a eunuch, a eunuch is a castrated man. And the eunuchs had a unique position inside of the Chinese government. These guys worked in the palace as advisors and servants to the emperor. So the mandarins are outside. They're doing the government's bidding, making sure that everybody does what the government wants. The eunuchs are inside the government, helping the emperor make decisions. The reason that they had to be castrated is that remember that in Confucian society, Confucianism was based on family. And a castrated man can't have a family. So these guys were seen as uh, people whose power only came from the emperor. They couldn't have their own power. So they were thought of as safe. They weren't going to try to overthrow the emperor because they didn't have a family. And in this sense, we, we might even think about these guys like the nobility in Versailles. 
right? Because they're people that can't rebel against the leader. The nobility are, have kind of been depowered by living at Versailles with Louis watching them all the time. The eunuchs are kind of the same thing, except they've been physically depowered, unlike the nobility who are just kind of meta metaphorically depowered. Okay, so let's talk about some of the highlights of the Ming Dynasty. So maybe the first big highlight was the reemergence of Confucianism. The next one is what we would consider to be the Great Wall of China. So this was built throughout the Ming Dynasty. Oh, and I didn't give you the, give you the dates. So this was built throughout the Ming Dynasty. And it served several purposes. It served as a big public works project. And giving people money, keeping them busy so they don't rebel. So money and something to do to prevent rebellion. But it also served as a way to keep the Mongols out. Maybe if it didn't work literally, it was a symbolic gesture to reassert Chinese ideas. Like, we're done with the Mongols, they are gone. Yeah, physically, it might keep the Mongols out, but it's also a symbolic gesture to reassert that China is back. But maybe the most important thing to come out of the Ming Dynasty were the naval expeditions of Zheng Ha. And these started really early in the Ming Dynasty. So 1403 to 1423. So basically, what Zheng Ha was sent out to do was to tell everyone in Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean that the Chinese are back. The Mongols had kind of let this part of the trade routes slip. And what Zheng Ha is doing is reasserting Chinese influence on these maritime trade routes. The Mongols were fine with trading on land. They had kind of neglected the maritime stuff. And Zheng Ha was sent out to tell everybody, hey, we're back, and things are going to get back to the way they used to be. So he went with these giant boats. 
that were called treasure ships. And he went on multiple trade missions extracting kowtows from the leaders of the places he visited. And so once he, once he got the kowtow, you know, he would bestow Chinese luxury goods on the people and, you know, trade would resume. Now, these might have continued. So these trade missions might have continued. But the emperor that sent Zheng Ha died in 1423 and with that emperor the kind of need to explore and exert Chinese influence around Southeast and East Asia also died. And it's at this point where China turns inward and begins to kind of isolate itself. And we'll talk more about that in our next video. But before we leave here, I did want to say a couple of other things about Zheng Ha, because Zheng Ha is a, is a very interesting character and a real product of this more global nature that we're dealing with now. Zheng Ha was a Muslim and there were more Muslims inter interacting with the Chinese at this time. And he was also a eunuch. So he was, I guess, technically a slave of the emperor. So there's a lot going on. To un there's a lot to unpack when we talk about Zheng Ha. The fact that he was a Muslim is really interesting considering that we're talking about the interaction between Muslim merchants and Chinese merchants. So the fact that he was a Muslim is a fact, is a show of cultural diffusion. And the fact that he was a eunuch meant that he was a slave of the emperor, but he was given all of this crazy authority to do stuff, which does kind of change how we think about the idea of slavery. So we should get, we shouldn't think about slavery just in terms of African slavery. That was its own thing and awful and horrible, but it's not the only type of slavery there was. And Zheng Ha is an example of a slave that was given lots of authority and he became a very important person. So we'll stop there. I've kind of led you to a little bit of suspense as to what's going to happen with the Ming Dynasty.
uh, this is kind of a turning point. And in our next video, we'll talk about the decline of the Ming Dynasty and why they started to decline. And we'll talk about the start of the last Chinese dynasty called the Qing Dynasty. So until then, this is Mr. Nissen signing off.